So hello, Culture Factor family. Today, I have Trey Pizzetti with me, and he serves as the Director of Client Partnerships at Vayner NFT. He focuses on educating his clients on the advantages of NFTs and the business impact Web3 space can have on their relationships with consumers. He leads his clients in all stages of their NFT journey, ensuring authentic entry to the space and building long-term strategic NFT programs. Prior to joining Vayner NFT, he worked as a team lead at an artificial intelligence consulting firm and spent three years helping build DraftKings marketing partnerships. Trey is focused on putting his clients in a position to take advantage of the next generation of the internet. I'm so excited. So welcome, Trey. Yes, thank you so much for having for having me. I'm excited to be here. Yeah, this is super. Um, I want to dig right in and I've kind of just, in essence, I feel like I've dissected your bio um, a little bit um, because there was really some targeted things you said in there and I, and I want to dive in. So um, my questions might seem a, l a little long, which is not typical for me, but um, I, I want people to sort of understand some of the the backstory here if they're not as familiar with Gary Vaynerchuk. So perfect. Um, building impact in the web three space requires a ton of EQ and AQ. And Gary Vaynerchuk and all his various businesses have been the blueprint for making sure that the unattractive parts of web two do not sink seep into the company culture or the client relationships. Um, my show was kind of built on the conversation around company culture, and that's why it's so important to me. Um, so it's imperative that the people he entrusts also carry this determination to build an empathetic Web3. So you are tasked with all phases of a project with the client, from the authentic entry, the onboarding process, and setting the tone for their overall experience. So what parts of Trey's history whether that's your upbringing, school, uh, work experience, um, or just your entree into um, the the Vayner, uh, you know, whole umbrella prepared you for for this. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I think just starting off, you know, talking about how we try to em employ empathy on an everyday basis at, at Vayner NFT. I think it's really twofold. Um, number one really focusing on education and understanding that this space is complicated to get into for anyone, um, whether you're very technologically savvy or you're not. So when we're working with our clients or when we're working with um, team members internally or, or potentially with customers, um, thinking through how we can lead with education and, and help people um, not feel as intimidated and, and understand the space. And I think the more and more people who understand it and, and understand how to take advantage of the technology. It's just better for everyone involved. Um, so that's really something that we focus on um, with our clients. And then also trying to make sure that when we do launch NFT programs or work with partnerships um, in the NFT space, that we're thinking through the values and, and kind of what Web3 and and NFTs stand for and, and making sure that you have that community feeling and that these companies and these these IP holders are coming in and they're really trying to um, understand and learn from the space because this is a new technology that's ever evolving. Um, in terms of me personally, I would like to give a lot of credit to my parents. Um, I got was very fortunate, had really good, really good parents who taught um, a lot of really good values growing up, such as hard work and, and effort and um, and also empathy and, and understanding and, and trying to, um, you know, be very kind and, and helpful to everyone that you meet. So I think that they've been really driving forces in my life and, and always trying to um, bring those pillars into every situation that, that I've been in. I love that. I think we don't, a lot of people don't lean in on that enough. And I love that um, we have an opportunity to shift how we treat each other in web three like we can reinvent this if we can almost create a movement behind it and i love that it's already part of you you know that it's part of your upbringing and it's part of um the business you've put yourself in uh it's pretty special i you know i i used to be in boutique hospitality and 
it's it's a different kind of animal i think a lot of people don't realize like how white glove like how much hand holding is involved in hospitality because it's open 24 7 365 and i feel like there's a lot of similarities in web 3 and i don't know if you see this yourself but you know the blockchain is open 24 7 365 so we're not dealing with the same cadence in terms of investments or building out projects with brands and of course we're a multinational you're a multinational business so you have brands from all over the world like how do you do you see like that you almost have um that you almost behave like that like that it's a very like it's that five star mentality when you work with your brands I think that there's a lot to dissect there. I definitely in 100% agreement with you that there's a lot of similarities with hospitality because these things are happening um, around the clock and the NFT space is moving so quickly that the environment that we were in a week ago is not the same environment that we're in now. And I think that's you know very obvious right now because of just like where the price prices for a lot of projects are at. However, even on a more uh, a less drastic week um, the space just moves so quickly from day to day and there's a lot of people who are really innovating and pushing the space forward so you know when we you know driving back to empathy we want to be really empathetic about that with our our customers and our clients and and knowing that you know they might uh not have as much interest in the space and they and they probably don't have as much knowledge of the space so thinking through um, how we can, you know, on the education point, how we can really work to educate them, how we can filter through a lot of the noise and bring them the key insights and the key updates that are happening is really important for us. Um, and the other thing I'll say is that while the space does move quickly and there's a, a lot of things going on, um, you know, we think and, and I think personally, it's really important that you do take time away and that you go outside, you spend time for yourself, you work out, um, you do yoga, whatever you do to kind of get away and to relax and to make sure that you have um, strong mental health, I think is, is really important as well. Yeah, that whole mental health piece is really critical and and. Um, I think that from my exposure in this space, I've noticed that a lot of that hustle culture is bleeding in and it's scary because I think a lot of people don't know how to stop. Like they don't know how to go outside and, and take that break. Um, what do you, what do you personally do to, to take that break and to give yourself that space? Yeah, for me, it's really two things. Number one, working out and just making sure that that gets into my schedule, whether it's, you know, playing soccer or going to the gym. Um, that's really important for me. And that's something I've learned over the years that just helps me out. And the other one is just sometimes turning it off. So, hey, uh, making sure you're not checking your email when you're out at dinner with friends and family um, and just making sure that you do have that space because um, it can consume um, a lot of your time. And for me, what I realized is that if I do take that time away, or if I do work out, I actually become more productive overall, because I'm uh, not as stressed out. I'm not as like worried about what's going on. And I actually come at my work with a lot clearer head. Yeah, that's nice. That's nice that you do that. Um, I hate when people come to the dinner table with the phones. That makes me crazy, especially when you go out to eat. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it's something that's becoming more and more common um, as you know the society just continues to live more digitally. Uh, but there is something to be said about having that conversation with someone in person and really being able to dive deep, especially if it's a more personal uh, conversation. Yeah. Um, what I'd love to do, I'm going to just switch gears a little bit. So, one of the things that comes up on the shows and I notice in a lot of um, open forums when people talk or you know you go to an event um, there's the conversation around roadmaps and rug pulls um, and I think for artists this is something that's really hard because they have to build out a roadmap and if they're unsuccessful in meeting any part of the promises made they can get canceled, you know, the whole cancel culture thing. Um, but what excited me about having this conversation with you is that you are achieving at a really high level in this NFT ecosystem with Vayner FT. Like you, you are finding a way to build roadmap, uh, roadmaps and work with your clients. So 
part of your role specifically is building long-term strategic programs and it's with very high profile clients. So, um, how, how do you do that? Like, how do you build something out with them that is reliable, that, um, won't get canceled, that won't burn them out? Um, because these roadmaps have a lot in them sometimes, like, how do you do that? How do you solve for that? Yeah, I mean that's a really good question. It's something that we're working with, um, and and we're and we're trying to get better at every day. I would say a lot of it has to do with like the intent, and when we're going in and we're pitching these companies or we're looking to work with them, um, we are coming in. We're saying, hey, as Vayner NFT, this is what we do, and what we do is we build long term programs, and we. Um, we want to make sure that you, um, when you enter in this partnership, are also committed to that goal because that's something that we are, are very uh, committed to and think it's a, a pillar of our business. However, we also try to build in some flexibility. As I mentioned before, the space moves really quickly. And so we don't know exactly what it's going to look like six months from now or a year from now. We don't know, you know, Meta could release a, a huge project. They mentioned this week that they're going to use Polygon. That could be a huge impact on the space. Um, you know, that's and that's just one example of, of kind of the unknowns out there that could be very altering for what we want to do with brands and how brands want to interact with their consumers using this technology. So it's really kind of that balance of, hey, we want lo we need long term commitment, but we also want to remain flexible. I think when we're talking about roadmaps, um, you know, there's a lot of roadmaps out there that people stick right to. And there's a lot that don't um, that people don't. I think that a roadmap to me is really just a commitment that you're going to continue to uh, be there for the community. And if you can instill that trust without a roadmap, I think then that's a great way to go as well. A roadmap is, a, is, is an easy way to display it. But I think a lot of it is really just that intent of the way that you're interacting with your community. And that's what value you want to bring, whether you're an NFT project or whether you're a brand launching multiple NFTs. Have you found that there are maybe utilities or, um, you know, any experiences or things that they want to do along the way that you've maybe had to go the other direction with your client and say, no, we shouldn't build this in because it could make it very difficult for us to see your vision. Like, do, does that ever happen? Like their, their goals are almost too audacious for their first project kind of thing. I definitely think so. Um, you know, a lot of what we're trying to focus on utility is giving the token holders of an NFT, a brand's NFT project, like experiences that money can't buy. Um, a lot of these brands have really, really cool assets, uh, whether they're partnerships that they've had in the past or whether it's just like um, like touring of a brewery that you might not be able to do as just a um, regular consumer and, and trying to unlock those types of things are a lot of the recommendations that we're giving um, at this point. However, you know, we are really trying to focus on bringing brands like very authentically into the space. And one of the biggest things that we're pushing is that, you know, you don't have to drop an NFT project, like a full 10,000 um, NFT project to enter the space. So maybe it's a partnership with an existing project. Maybe um, there's other avenues that you can do to kind of like start getting into the space and learning and what I'll also say here is that there's a lot of legal teams and also um, you know, corporate security teams that are still getting their head around the regulations and how they should be treating NFTs and cryptocurrencies. So a lot of brands will come in with really amazing ideas that fit their consumer. However, their own internal organizations are still kind of working through some of the logistics and how these things will be handled um, with the government. Um, and I think that is something that we're working through a lot and, and really centers around education and making sure that everyone understands the problems that we're trying to solve and exactly like how the logistics of um, creating an NFT works. And then the legal teams and treasury teams are able to make really educated decisions. Not that the educated decision is always the ability to, that you should launch an NFT, but making sure that they have all the information in front of them to make the best decision for the, the brand itself. It's really perceptive. Like I, I love that you recognize that sometimes their infrastructure does not allow for it. Um, 
That's really cool. I hadn't really thought about it that way. <laughs> it's really cool. Um, when you were either with DraftKings or, or we could just stay on Vayner NFT, um, have you done any like projects that were really felt like you were breaking new ground? Like you didn't see what it was that you guys were creating and then it like turned into magic? Yeah, for sure. I think that there's been a, a couple um, in my career, but one that was just really exciting for me personally was when I joined DraftKings, they were only a daily fantasy company. Um, and then shortly after that, PASPA, which basically was the federal ban on sports gambling, um, was repealed by the Supreme Court. And so we pivoted very dramatically into launching a sports book. So I joined in May and then we were working very hard on launching our sports book product in New Jersey, um, which was the first state that allowed it. So that was a moment where we were really all working very hard and focusing on getting this product launched as quickly as possible to be one of the first uh, companies in the space. But in the moment, we didn't really know what to expect. And we didn't really know how it was going to go. And it was a brand new market in the United States. And we were a company that had never dabbled in the sportsbook space. We were only in the daily fantasy space. So it was one of those moments in, in your career where you're just like very excited about what you're doing, but you're not 100% sure um, exactly how it's going to turn out. And for me, that's like where, where I really like to be. I like to be on the, the forefront of, of innovation and being living a day-to-day -day and working a day-to-day -day that you don't really know what tomorrow is going to look like, but you know, you're working on something exciting. So that was really a huge reason why I enjoyed my time at DraftKings. And now I'm really enjoying my time at Vayner NFT is there's actually a lot of similar um, themes between the launching, launching of sports betting in the United States, as well as this Web3 NFT space um, in terms of the innovation and the way that brands are going to interact with consumers, the way that consumers are going to interact with media. Um, and I, I personally want that to continue to be like a foundation of my career as I move forward. I love that. That's really great. Um... And so nice that you recognize like which parts of the process fire you up. Um, I think being on the bleeding edge of trend and technology, I, I empathize with you. Like I feel the same way. I love being immersed um, in that space because that's where like you're, where the most growth happens, I feel like. Um, so that being said, like, are there any projects that right now you're especially excited about that you could share? Yeah, for me, a lot. I mean, you're talking about in the NFT space specifically. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, I mean, there's a lot for me. I think I, I try to focus a lot more on like the utility and like the people who are really trying to uh, push, use the technology to push things going forward. So I'll highlight to the first one being um, Altered State Machine. And so what they're doing is they are working to build decentralized or the ability to train, own, and sell decentralized uh, artificial intelligence. So right now, if you want to create artificial intelligence, you um, train it using AWS or Google servers. Um, and you basically would use their computing power in order to run the iterations that you need in order to train it. However, there's, that is always going to be the case for the top 10% of artificial intelligence and, and like basically the, the bleeding edge of the space. However, there's this other 90% of more like niche use cases that are going to, um, that there's going to be a lot more things that we can do. So for example, if I went and I built a chatbot for a coffee shop, right now there's not a ton of, um, use cases for that. However, if there's a way that I could build the best chat bot and then I could rent it to all the coffee shops and they could pay me $5 a month to use my chat bot, that is something that could be um, an awesome idea and a, a great way to basically expand the space and have very practical niche use cases. So what they're doing is they're basically moving that to blockchain technology where I could have an ownership record as a form of an NFT of that artificial intelligence um, uh, file. And then what I could do is I could actually go rent that out. And what's really exciting to me is this applies to a lot of different um, situations. So for example, in gaming, you would be able to have a 
a artificial intelligence bot that would be another character in a game so i could be playing a first person shooter and my i could have a team of three other um of my controlled characters that are all uh, artificial intelligence bots that I own. And then if I train them up and they become really good, well, then I can sell them to other people who want to play the game. So to me, this is just a really exciting project because it kind of comes with a lot of the stuff that I've done in my past jobs. And I'm very excited about the space. And I think that it's going to give a lot of people the tools um, to be creative and to really apply a lot of these, um, ex a lot of the exciting things that can have an AI on a more decentralized level, instead of just like the top companies owning it. I think the top companies will still always own like the very complex models and they'll still be the ones who are really pushing the edge. But I think there's like this 90%, like I mentioned, that are going to be greatly benefit from this decentralization. So that one's number one. And I think that the second one, for me is really um, Link Style, which is a community of golfers who um, are basically using an NFT as some sort of like rewards or, or fan club that um, will come together and um, do different events. And they have some long-term really ambitious goals. But for me, it's just really cool to see that um, moving into uh, this Web3 space and basically building that community and, and having benefits because you're a part of that um, in terms of discounts, in terms of experiences. And I think that they're just doing a really good job um, around like a niche like golf. That's really cool. I'm going to need to share that with a couple of people. My uh, sister-in-law is a top 50 LPGA instructor, so she probably would find that very interesting. Um, I love the concept of the AI technology NFT and how you can buy it and rent it out so it could, when people are looking to diversify their income, that could be a form of passive income. So that's a really cool model. Yeah, it's very interesting. I think that the idea of like NFTs as passive incomes are is going to be very interesting as we move forward. So another one, another project that, that's Gary's is the Fly Fish Club, which is a, a restaurant where you have to have a very high end restaurant in New York City where you have to actually own one of the tokens to make a reservation. So this is a concept um, that is, you know, has been proven in, at, I can't remember the name of the steakhouse in New York, but basically the, at the steakhouse in the West Village, you have a standing reservation for your time every week and you can get people to fill it. However, you can't just like call up and make a reservation if you're not, uh, if you don't have a standing one. So I think like moving that to a, an opportunity where you have to own an NFT to have a reservation at a high end club um, is really beneficial for both parties because for the restaurant they're also having an additional source of income where they're getting startup by launching their nft they're getting startup capital in order to build out the restaurant and create an amazing experience they're also getting secondary sales revenue royalties which will allow them to sustain and have an additional form of income if they do make an amazing experience what's cool from the consumer perspective is not only do you get access to the um to the restaurant to go when you want to you could also rent out your, your pass and your NFT on a monthly basis. So if someone comes in from London and they're going to be in New York for a weekend or for a month, you could actually have them rent out your token and go to the restaurant and you would get some um, passive income for doing that and for actually owning that asset. So that's just one example. And I think as we... Um, see the nft space and the web3 space continue to move forward you're going to see a lot more like creative use cases of the technology like that and not that the profile pictures is the wrong way to use the technology but i think we're going to see um, a continued push and there's just a lot of creative and innovative people in the space who are seeing this technology and saying like hey what can i do with it i love that the idea of renting out your token so that you can utilize this very exclusive restaurant and be a part of a membership, even if you're not physically a part of the membership from the beginning. And I had heard that, and, and so I think this is a similar use case. I had heard that there were um, people who bought the NFT for VCon um, and my understanding is that that NFT is good for the next three years to attend that conference, but somebody might have bought it and they can't go this year 
and they know that they're going to go next year. So they rent out their ticket for that one year opportunity, that one conference opportunity for 2022 or 2023, whichever year they couldn't do it for. It's very similar. Um, and I hope I didn't speak wrongly, but I had heard that through the grapevine. So is that true? Like so, some people are like Airbnb being their VCon ticket? <laughs> Yeah, so I think it's very close and it's a very similar concept. The way that the VCon tickets work, from my understanding, was if you owned a, a VFriend Series 1, which was the original VFriend, VFriend collection, the utility that it came with was you get entrance to VCon for the first three years. And the way they did that was they actually airdropped an additional NFT in or three additional NFTs, one for each of the years, at, and that serves as your ticket. So if you're not able to go this year, what you could actually do is you could actually sell that ticket to someone else who is interested in going. Um, and so that's just like a, a really exciting way to do it as well. And, and that one is more in the form of like an additional NFT. However, both of them work great in terms of um, providing value to your token holders in your community. I love that. Um, let me, I have a question for you. Um, what, uh, brands or areas of, of business, um, are you dreaming about creating NFT projects with? Like if, if you could just go off and find clients at this point, what would it be? Yeah. For me personally, I think sports teams and, and sports and athletes are, uh, are definitely like, just because of my personal interest in, in sports. Um, I think that there's a huge opportunity for sports teams to come in and offer NFTs at, to their fans and provide really unique utility for that. So some of the things that, you know, just off the top of my head that I brainstorm are, are things like, Hey, like a special security entrance. If you have like the highest level of the NFT, um, the ability to uh, design uh, merch merchandise for the team and basically being able to have some say into like what they're selling. Um, the idea that you could come and pitch the GM for a half hour about like how you think the team should operate moving forward. Not that they have to take all the recommendations, but just the ability to do that would be uh, very interesting. And then the last one that I think is cool is the, uh, the ability to go play like a pickup game on their uh, field or on the stadium on a oh, day where cool. the team's not playing. So there's just a really cool things for like a, a sports teams. And if you're operating one to basically come out and like understand what your clients would like or what your customers would like to do and then provide them that utility and, you know, making sure that you are, are giving back to your community and, and that your community is, is really representing themselves by owning your token. I think like what we're going to see as you move forward in the space is that a lot of your digital, digital identity is going to be defined by like what you hold in your wallet. So these brands and these teams getting NFTs into consumers wallets now um, as those more front end platforms where you can display what you own in your wallet. Um, I know Coinbase has just released a more social NFT platform, um, but that's just going to become more and more important um, over time as our digital identity means more. Yeah, it's interesting. I had this conversation um, recently uh, with an, with another guest, and I think, you know, there's the side of your identity where, like, you want to be associated with things. So they, you know, they're calling that virtue signaling, if you mm -hmm. will. You know, your profile picture represents what you want people to see about you. Um, but the ability to go into somebody's wallet and to see a track record of what they're collecting um, could also drive supply and demand of it and also speak volumes around the type of person you are, like what you're interested in. So I wonder, will people start to, you know, just create alternate wallets that give them a little anonymity? I don't know. Yeah, one of the most interesting things that I've heard um, in terms of talking about this and, and uh, being anonymous online. And, and I'm not sure this is exactly how it's going to play out, but I thought it was a very like thought provoking article is that as we're moving forward, and this is probably more like 10 to 15 years out that you might have like multiple personas 
online. So one of your personas would be what you like your work persona and how you're going to go and like interact with a potentially like virtual job. And you would want to have that to be like very professional so that you are like um, easily hireable and you'd want to show off your skills. Another one would be like your personal. So this would be more about like what you think would be fun, you know, things that represent you um, as, as a person. And then your last one would be like political and like how you represent yourself in that way. So I, I don't know if it's exactly going to play out like that, but I do think it's very interesting to think about how you represent yourself online and how that might change as we get more and more into, as, as we live more and more of our lives in this digital space. Yeah, it's a great point. It is a great point. And um, I'm, I'm fascinated by that. Like I, the whole concept that somebody would, you know, try and shape that. And, and I don't know that it's dissimilar actually to social media web too, you know, like you present yourself one way on LinkedIn, but maybe you present yourself, um, your person, you know, that's your professional. And then your personal might be on say Instagram or Facebook, and then maybe your political slash your business are on Twitter. Like, I feel like some people kind of already embody different personalities, even on social media. So it'll be interesting to see like how their wallets express that, like how we move towards that. I think that's a really, really good point. And I would also just add on to that. It's, I think it's very similar to how we act in our real lives on a day-to-day -day basis. So when you're at work or in the office, you act a little bit differently than if you're at home with your friends. Um, and that's even different than when you're home with your family. Um, and it doesn't mean that you're a different person, but there's just different social norms in each of those spaces. And you're you know, talking about different topics um, and just acting a little bit differently because of those environments that you're in. So it's really just carrying over a lot of the things that humans have done for a long time into these new technologies. Um, and, and so it will be interesting to see how it plays out and what platforms you're going to want to bring um, different social norms to. Yeah. And we have, we haven't even talked about the metaverse. <laughs> exactly. Um, let's see. So, um, earlier we talked about, you know, the possibilities of, you know, ideas coming into the space and how you had said, you know, like your ideal would be, um, you know, the sports area. So are you then, if we look at V friends, discord channels, um, DAOs, distributed autonomous, uh, organizations. Um, sorry, I, I said that all wrong. Decentralized. Decentralized. Auto <laughs> yeah. Sorry. I, I no, had to put word in my head. Um, are you open to like partnerships or like creators that come up with ideas even within your ecosystem of like V friends and discord channels and stuff like that? Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, we talked earlier about like the values of the space. And I think that a lot of the values of the space are like empowering artists and empowering like individuals who are, you know, really trying to push the envelope and, and make new projects. So that's something that we really try to carry over with our um, our work at Vayner NFT, as well as we try to instill in the programs and, and when we're working with brands. I just think that those are really good characteristics that we want to continue to be seen um, going forward. And, and I also mentioned this is that, you know, launching an NFT program might not be the best move in the NFT space for everyone. You know, there's a lot of opportunities for brands to partner with existing NFT projects um, or work with uh, NFT artists who already have really good followings and, and empower them to build um, amazing collections or amazing programs. So um, it's, it's really hard because the space is so new to have like this one size fit all playbook. I think that there's a lot of different options in when you're thinking about approaching the space. And, you know, as we move forward and, and those options are just going to continue to get more and more, but that also presents opportunity for, for brands and for IP owners to come in and, and have a successful entrance and, and be a, a brand that's a leader um, in the space. Mm, I wonder if there's like that perfect client like that you've been dreaming about <laughs> doing something like this with, is there like, like, a, is there a certain team or something that you just love that you're like, oh my gosh. This would, yeah. this would be perfect case scenario. Mm, that's, that's good. I mean, I'm a Detroit sports fan, so we don't have a lot of really good sports teams right now. Um, and that's kind of been a theme over the last 10 or, or 15 years. So um, 
I, I also went to the University of Michigan and Michigan football is huge for me. So that would probably be like a dream client for me personally. Um, I also would love to partner with, um, you know, artists like musical artists and the music in the NFT space is very interesting as well. Um, when you're thinking about how artists will fund themselves as they move forward and how they're interacting with their clients and or with their customers and how those customers are going to be able to get access um, to the artists. So uh, I, th I think that those two for me would be the ones that like I'm thinking about and, and would be excited about. Yeah, the um, I, I love the the alma mater type of thing like you know that everybody has their roots and uh, I think that's really cool and I think the music model is one of the more interesting ones to me too I keep looking at that um, I'm convinced I was probably like a DJ in my past life or something because I just love music so much but the idea that like they could cross pollinate on platforms like they can stream stay with like say Spotify for the larger body of fans and listeners like to find, to be more discoverable right but then they can maybe release um you know individual songs not maybe an entire album but like individual songs as an nft and sell that and when somebody's done with it they can sell it as well and create like royalties and a legacy that might be bigger than what they get from the streaming service. Because right now, like they, it's like they get pennies from what I understand. I mean, not Lady Gaga, but you know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like independent artists, right? For sure. I, I think that I'm in, in complete agreement that this is one of the most exciting um, areas of the space. I think that we're super early on. Um, what you're going to see a lot starting is... A, artists continuing to use a lot of traditional uh, music channels like Spotify, Apple Music, because that is successful, especially for the big artists. Um, and what they'll do is they'll supplement with NFTs or with this and they'll use it as a, a pseudo fan club, right? So if you own a specific NFT, you get to talk to a, uh, or you get a 30 minute FaceTime or you get to sit front row at every one of their concerts. I know that's been done before. You get specific merch. So basically like an additive um, way to engage with your fans. And we talked about this, but just having that ability to have like your NFT in people's wallet and associated with people's identity is really important and, and, and very useful to the artist. I think like as you move forward and we get more clarity on regulation, what you're going to see a lot more of is the ability to actually make like investments in artists. Um, and so there's still a lot up in the air um, and that would be considered security. So there's additional things that we're going to have to get clarity on from the, from the U S government about how these are going to be handled. But the idea that you could hear an amazing, amazing uh, artist in a bar and they're going to launch a 10,000 NFTs for $2 each to get $20,000 to uh, buy studio time. And then they're going to give 10% of that album that they're going to use that studio time to create to all the token holders. Like the concepts like that are, are super exciting and apply not just to artists, but to multiple sectors and, and athletes um, in, in different areas. So while that is further down the road, things like that are, are probably going to be coming. I know that the security token market is already uh, exploring a lot of these types of use cases um, a little bit on a higher level, especially in like residential and like the ownership of, of large expensive assets. However, as the space continues to innovate, we're probably going to move closer and closer to like security tokens and NFTs will, will probably come closer together and you'll see NFTs who are actually treated like, like, like security. So that's really interesting to me. I think having those alt access to alternative investments and also artists having multiple ways to fundraise not just from like traditional um not just from like traditional avenues i think is something that i'm personally excited about yeah it's so interesting what you pointed out in there so it's kind of like a circular economy that they create which is just sort of a really cool concept 
Yeah. And, you know, if you are found someone and you invested in their first album, well, then and you get some of the royalties. Well, now you become their biggest fans. Right. And what you're doing is you're telling your friends and you're telling your your family, like, hey, you got to check out this artist. You're promoting it on your own social medias. And then what that does is it in- increases the artist's popularity. So like the return on the investment for the artist actually becomes a lot higher because these people have now a financial interest um, in and and you being successful and you know you see this already specifically with artists where you're like oh i discovered that artist first or like i found this new music i went to this concert like that culture is already something that exists and this is going to just amplify that as we move forward i think what's really cool is it sort of brings us right back to that conversation too about like empathy and kindness and i think we are we are creating a different model that way. I love that your upbringing, you know, it's in your DNA, it's in the, the Vayner media DNA, everything that they're doing. Um, you know, it's what I do here on my show. Um, I try to bring diversity and empathy and, and, and all of these things for the con- to the conversation because I think um we need to be part of solving for the future right and we need to be part of building web3 to look the way we would like it to look Um, and i'm excited that you are building partnerships and and helping to solve for that i think it's really yeah i really appreciate you uh you know really focusing on those those key things i think that this is uh, you're doing a great job and I really appreciate you uh, having me on. I think the one thing I'll, I'll say is that, you know, there's always going to be bad actors. Um, but as long as you have people in the communities that you're in who are individually representing those values and, and continue and, and believe in them, uh, that's a good long term recipe for those values to come out on top. So no matter what technology, no matter what your space you're in, there's going to be bad actors and there's going to be rug pulls. There's going to be um, people who are taking advantage of other people. However, it's really just about trying to continue to bring that on an everyday basis, in your case, in every podcast basis. So um I, I'm just excited to be on the show and I appreciate you having me. Thank you, Trey. And, you know, I agree with you on that. Um, I would point out that the bad actors have always been around. I think people are also trying to point fingers at it to maybe scare people away. But, you know, back in the, what, the 1900, early 1900s, they were called snake oil salesmen. And, you know, when in web two, even like if you jump further uh, ahead, you know, there's a lot of people that would steal identities and all kinds of business scams. So you're you're never going to completely escape it. Um, But I like that um, bigger companies are starting out in this space with a different viewpoint. And um, I'm really happy that you have found uh, your spot there. It looks like it's a good fit. Thank you for coming. Yeah, I'm very excited uh, to be at Vayner NFT. We're super excited about the future. And and like I said, I really appreciate you having me on. This has been a, a really insightful conversation. Thank you. Thanks for coming on Culture Factor. I'm often asked, does my business need a podcast? My answer is yes. That nothing else is the fast track into thought leadership and being established and seen as the expert in your industry as podcasting. What's increasingly evident is that it's a branding machine. It kicks doors open for you to have conversations with leaders. It creates a pathway to partnerships and connections on a deeper level. You will not be your industry's best kept secret. Your ideas and business will have global reach. Go to hollyshannon.com to launch your podcast now.